I, I love this essay, Tom, and the description of nature as an idea that it's because it's so often taken, it's, it's, it's so often assumed, like what we mean by nature. Everyone has these, takes for granted what's meant by nature. It's, it's one of these unexamined concepts. And when something is as unexamined as the concept of nature, you know that you're in the realm of ideology. Ideology is always, a, a, the, the, it's always the water that the fish is swimming in, that the fish has no concept of, but which is everywhere. Uh, there is a strong, that, there's, there's a limited uh, strain. I'm really interested in this guy because I've never read him, but I've been interested in Raymond Williams' idea of nature um, and Winston Spurn, the landscape um, critic, um, and Tafuri, I mean, it all kind of in a way, Tafuri in Architecture Utopia, when he starts, I actually just brought it up, if I may share it with you, when he starts it with, uh, it's from a slideshow, he starts talking about um, Abbe Logier's, um, you know, this, this thing here, yeah, that thing, uh, the first, which Tafuri says is the first book on the city as a theory of the city. Um, in which, you know, we have this famous image of architecture being rooted in primitive, some kind of primitive, um, non-man-made uh, construction. Um, and Tafuri's take on it is uh, that this naturalism has a function of its own, which is of assuring to art artistic activity an ideological role in the strictest sense of the term. Uh, in exactly the same moment when bourgeois economy began to discover and invent its own categories of action and judgment, giving to values contents directly commensurable with the dictates of the new methods of production and exchange, the crisis of the old system, i.e. the medieval or the ancient system of relationship to nature and the countryside and production, was immediately hidden by recourse to new sublimations, rendered artificially objective by means of the call to the universality of nature. Um, in fact, you can go back further even, or maybe contemporaneous to the physiocrats uh, in France at the time who were inventing what became classical economics based on some idea of nature. The idea that if that the ancient Chinese had developed a way of farming, which was actually a mere extension of natural processes. And the, to a large extent, or to some extent, Adam Smith's invisible hand is the development of that theory. A theory of nature, an artificially, a theory we call artificially objective theory, in which to sublimate, in which to hide the real upheaval that's going on in Europe in the 18th century, when new methods of production. So Lucius Burkhardt refers to, you can mute me if you want to, uh, he refers to the English garden, which is of course happening at the moment when the landscape is becoming privatized for industrial purposes. And at precisely this moment, an image of nature emerges. But I really like Lucius Burkert's inclusion of the French Garden in his description of how nature is ritualized in the forest, and it's brilliantly written. And I thought I that was fantastic. I, I'd never thought of that, uh, never seen that analogy before. Yeah. I thought it was wonderful. It's, uh, Ve it's, uh, vegetation as information is a brilliant connection <laughs> too. That we we are constantly trying to, in fact, uh, obfuscate this information, kind of sublimate it or cover it up with some idea of nature. This is why I recommend we should read Raymond Williams, The uh, Ideas of Nature. It's, 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 on, it's PDF online, it's from the 70s. It's just a great overview of how these ideas of nature have appeared in literature and to a certain extent in art um, since the Enlightenment and, and before. So great text. I didn't get to read about uh, Lucius Burkett. So what's that about? Maybe, maybe Tom. If you want to like introduce to the introduce the text, introduce sort of like oh, yeah. how you came across it, and also like introduce Burkhardt as well, because I didn't get uh, fully through the the piece on uh, Burkhardt and what he was about, but I thought it was really interesting as well. Okay, uh, I, I'm going to give you a really po a poorly informed uh, account because well, this, that's just kind of how I how I got to know him. Um, I suppose as part part of our work, uh, looking into um, sort of um, ways of rethinking design, uh, ways of looking at uh, developing kind of much more open or democratic or participatory uh, design processes or, or, or ways of thinking about the, the city. Um, I've been looking at um, a, lot, a lot of German 
uh, architect well, um, planners, what they've been um, talking about and thinking about. And uh, it was kind of through that, uh, particularly through the work of a guy called Jesko Fazer, who's, um, who's uh, an architect and kind of teacher in Berlin at the moment. Um, and so, so it was through, through him, uh, I came to Burkhardt and, and Lucius Burkhardt was kind of active in the um, sort of latter half of the 20th century, really. Uh, he's Swiss, but he, I think he pretty much spent most of his career in, in Germany. And uh, he, yeah, uh, uh, as Gary said, he was, uh, he was head of the school in Ulm uh, for a while. And Ulm was set up as, as a kind of a, uh, a second Bauhaus uh, with, uh, with another Swiss guy called Max Bill. Um, and I think Burkhardt kind of fell out of there. Um, so uh, he, he was quite, I think, influenced by the 68ers. Um, and try to kind of develop new ways of teaching architecture, kind of to, to take into account what, what the 68 years were kind of going on about, which was basically that students should have a much greater say in how they're taught and, and so on. Um, so I've uh, kind of read a fair bit of his stuff then um, that's been translated into English. There isn't that much, there's like only two books really. Um, but I, I just find it kind of really quite clear um, on, on a number of levels and not least of which like the language level, it's, it's written in a quite a fairly transparent way, I find. Um, so that, that's really all I know. Um, I thought this, this was a good, I wanted to actually recommend another um, piece called uh, either Invisible Design or Who Plans the Planning, uh, which, which are interesting um, articles, but I thought for, for this format, uh, this particular article might be interesting because just because of that Rem Coolhouse uh, article that we read a couple of weeks ago uh, as a sort of um, slightly different approach to, to the topic. I, I found myself thinking actually when I was reading this because I was, I was just rereading, I read it last night and I'm re, I was rereading it again just before this and I found myself sort of thinking I don't Anywhere in the text, I don't really see like if he if he comes to a concrete definition or a concrete answer to the question of of what is nature. Like in, in my notes, I have written down. It seems like he reasons himself into a corner in a way where, by his definition or by his arguments, the only way to achieve nature or naturalness is by the complete removal of humans, not just from a certain area of land, but from the entire face of the earth, he, especially when he talks about where he's sort of condemning, maybe not necessarily condemning, that's perhaps a bit too strong of a word, where he's talking about the um, nature reserves and stuff like that, and how, in fact, nature reserves aren't even natural in and of themselves because they are things of human creation. Um, and I, I think like he make, makes a lot of valid points about like our ideas of nature and how they are flawed and how they are rooted in an aesthetic or, or as he sort of says it, it's, it's a seeing thing, but it's not a perception thing. Like I, I, this is, I think it's interesting, this notion of nature itself, the whole idea of nature. It strikes me, you know, that at least in the way that we have structured it, that it is something that's comes sort of what well, comes from Genesis, you know, that man will have dominion over the fish in the sea and the fowl of the air, whatever it is. In other words, that man will do with the earth whatever man sees fit. And it's, I mean, if you take the Genesis element out of it, um, then the whole, the Western notion of what nature is sort of falls down. Um, so I think that, you know, it strikes me that what we're looking at, what we have been looking at for the past two or three hundred years is a notion of nature that is essentially, let's say, in some way, maybe Lutheran or Calvinist, which is something to do with the book of Genesis. And then our way of now dealing with the fact that, oh, well, because we saw it as a commodity, now we've got to deal with it in some other way because it's answering us back. That the, way, that the response is also some sort of derivative, mm -hmm. book of Genesis derivative. And I think um, because I, I don't really know if um, I don't really know if na nature in the way that you know we've come to know it as some sort of some some sort of derivative of some sort of means of production, mm -hmm. 
really exists outside of this construct. Uh, and I think, you know, if you go back to maybe how the Greeks saw the polis, or the working of the polis with the, each polis had to be self-sufficient in some sort of a way. You know, I'm not sure if, if, if people, you know, if, if you go back before Luther, you know, how many people before us really saw nature in the way that we kind of, like, I, I think it's sort of, I, I was discussing this with a friend of mine who happens to be a, an ag scientist, and he, he thought that, uh, he thought it was fascinating that we were reading it, you know, and he was saying, you know, that uh, part of the problem when architects are reading things is that there's just such a lack of precision about the terminology that we use. Things aren't agreed. And uh, I, I do think that this is, I, I do think there is something in that. I mean, I, th I, mean, I, th I think that we, I, what I thought was fascinating about this, about Burkhardt's raising of the issue of like, what is this nature that we're all trying to preserve or that we're either going to build in or not going to build in. I think this is something that just has to be, you know, I really do think it's worthy of discussion and we're not going to be able to figure out an answer to it because I don't think there is necessarily an answer. But I mean, if we discuss it as a community, at the level at which Burkhardt is suggesting, we're going to arrive at a, a better arrangement, strikes me anyway. I was, I was very struck by the fact that, you know, you've got the Swiss have somebody like Burkhardt, and, and I'm sure there are others like him in other, other countries where the, the nature, you know, the, the, the issue of how do we make, how do we plan this thing? How do we apportion all this stuff with each other? Um, you know, that they can have somebody like, you know, a Burkhardt, somebody thinking like this, um, participating in the public debate. I mean, can you imagine, you know, Lucius Burkhardt speaking on Joe Duffy about planning? You know, can you imagine that happening? Can you imagine, you know, it just, can you imagine if somebody public, if Leo Varadka were to stand up tomorrow and say, what is nature? You know, we'd all go, oh, for Jesus sake, you know? And yet this is precisely what we have to be doing. It strikes me, you know? I think in an Irish context though, like that was another thing that I was thinking about when we were reading is like, we don't have any nature in the sense of what Burkhardt's sort of getting to where it's the absence of human, the absence of, of human intervention, like the Irish landscape is defined by human in intervention, like we, like if you think of typical Irish landscape, you think, think of perhaps like rolling green fields, but those fields in and of themselves are human interventions and it's it's not just mm. like a modern thing as well it's you know three thousand years old like you go to the cage of fields like that's not a natural landscape that's a landscape that is you know prehistoric production um that that is is defined by that human intervention and i mean i mean it's probably like there are natural elements to it like it, it has been perhaps in the absence of humans for over three thousand years it has not necessarily returned but moved into a state that is not what it was previously but it is also not what it was when humans were using it as their means I, 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 I definitely think it's true that one thing that distinguishes and I think it's one of the reasons why you know people say oh we're in such a charming place is that we do inhabit the landscape in some sort of non non-biblical way we just simply and how we exist in it. And, uh, and I know that maybe 10, 15 years ago, it was an awful to talk about one off houses in the countryside and so on and so forth and all that kind of thing. But I think, uh, you know, sometimes, yes, it's true that, you know, a house in the wrong place is not very pleasant or attractive to come upon. But I think maybe that debate was, we were kind of throwing out the baby with the bath water because the thing that makes Ireland special is this sort of habitation of the landscape. I think it's interesting, you know, if you all you have to do is just go to Scotland, where the lands where landscape's just empty, it's empty, empty, okay. and Agent. it's just it's a completely. I mean, it's just a very, very different. Uh, it's a very different experience, and I think that there's something very interesting about the po the positive, you know, about how Ireland can feel so. You know, a, a visit to the Irish uh, countryside can be such a wonderful experience that I think that, uh, you know, we should sit down and sort of think, well, why is that wonderful? You know, what's so good? Why, what are we doing right? I, I think, and, you know, I think there's an interesting, perhaps, side note to be made about that. Like, I think it's interesting that you mentioned Scotland as well, the, the differences between the sort of Scottish landscape and the Irish landscape, because the, well, I would argue the main reason why that's different is the question of ownership. 
something like 90% of the Scottish landscape, as you might refer to it, like not urban landscape, is owned still by the gentry. And it's it's in private ownership by, by landlords. And, you know, whereas the Irish landscape has systematically been divided up and, and has been redistributed to tenant farmers or what would have been tenant farmers pre, um, pre-independence. Um, so like that, that sort of charming landscape is perhaps something that is rooted in the social structure that was created by de Valera yeah. um, in the early 20th century. Uh, no, it was created by the, the, the form of the landscape was definitely created by the land acts from the 1880s mm-hmm. to, deal, to deal with home room and the land league by buying out empty estates or absentee estates and redistributing through credit schemes. Um, to, for before and after independence, but you're right, it, mm-hmm. it's a political decision to, um, and that's the, that probably explains the main difference between, it's not the only explanation because prior to the 19th century, um, uh, Scotland would have had different structures of, of farms and so on. So it wasn't just the, the, the land distribution. Um, but I think t- we, talk, we can keep talking about this and we don't think Ireland's that different. I mean, the ideas of Lucius Burkhardt's essay apply just as well to anywhere. They, they apply to everywhere where nature is produced or he talks, he refers to this production of nature, to this basic relationship of exploitation between man and nature. Um, I recommend that so many things I'd love you to read. J- Jason Moore, Wall Street is a way of organizing nature. It's a, it's a, it says it all in the title. Um, it marks is a footnote in Capital, which David Harvey spends, I think I talked about this before, where he spends a whole hour and a half talking about this one little footnote in Capital where Mark says that technology reveals man's dealings with nature, which therefore throws light upon the directly productive activities of humans, which in turn illuminates the relations which are formed at any stage in history around production. Uh, and which tells us then about the concepts and ideas. Um, So that there's this connection between nature, um, technology, human relations of production. So Marx is very interested in in breaking down the component parts of this relationship. It's actually taken up then by by Martin Heidegger in um, The Age of the World Picture, Mm -hmm. um, where he kind of specifically talks about the role of technology in, in this kind of in framing uh, exercise of technology um, where, where all of nature is reduced to standing reserve, is how he describes it. So nature, people included obviously, um, are understood techno- technologically as, a, as standing reserve, there to be exploited. And that, that kind of brings us back to the Burkhardt article a, a little bit in that, um, you know, he talks about how, how we only understand um, uh, I guess land or n- nature uh, as as a resource there to be exploited, um, and 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 now we've come to the point where we have to sort of consider nature like in another way, mm. be- be- because we've gone to that point uh, mm. now. So I, I guess this this I mean this the other aspect that you were saying about this kind of sublimation, which is which is very interesting as well in just this idea of the authentic. Uh, anything, but which is kind of just re- vaguely ridiculous notion in itself. But this uh, authentic landscape, uh, and look, kind of, uh, I'm I'm always struck about how how that translates then into architecture, mm. like in terms of um, um, uh, what's the Swiss guy called? Uh, Zumtor. Zumtor. Yeah. Yeah. Who, like these sort of. Know if it's kind of later work, these really vacuous kind of um, buildings which are just facing out onto onto the Atacama Desert, you know, or um, the Dorset landscape. Um, in this kind of in this kind of stupid kind of at, at the landscape. Um, so I, I guess you know this 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 sort of exploitation and this confusion about authentic, authenticity kind of always or as a way of working itself out in, in architecture as well and how we kind of just architects see the landscape as this sort of a object to be just gazed at you know in, in and where there's no other meaning with no other relationship with 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 the dwelling or with the, yeah. whatever that structure is 
in fact, it, the idea of nature in that sense perhaps always is a, a representation of nature from which is removed evidence of production. And maybe the biggest thing that's removed in any ideological structure from this evidence of production is the notion of human nature. So there's a great book called The Ecological Rift, written by four people, but led by a guy called John Bellamy Foster. And the beginning, it begins with a description of a chemist called Von, I'll come back to it, who did studies in England in the 1840s. Von, ah, he's a chemist, German, and Marx discovered him. And he showed how nutrient, nutrient depletion had begun in places which had become industrialized. And he actually, even way back then, described it in terms of the breaking of a cycle, a cycle of production. Food being grown in one place, consumed, and the waste being produced in that one place. And right next door to it were communities which had been subject to industrialization, where the population was no longer living there, where they were living in towns. So the food was grown in one place, brought to a town, and the waste now became pollution, and the soil became depleted. I mean, one of the major, uh, one of the major categories of, of ecological crisis is soil depletion. It's, it's been going on from the very earliest time and the, the earliest agricultural uh, time and the problems of fertilizer pollution and so on. But in this book, uh, The Ecological Rift, they, he insists on the, the term, the exploitation of human and extra human nature. And, and this would be to bring the Marxist perspective is to include human nature as a category of exploitation. So therefore we, we see both in terms of the exploitation of workers in the, and the imperialist projects in which human nature as, as well as natural, what we think of as natural resources, become commodified and turned into waste. And waste is produced, um, which is the, the foundation of our crisis. Can I come back uh, to, to what Tom said as well, to what Mark was just responding to, um, where the, the example that you raised of, of like a, a house looking out at a, a natural landscape or what a wilderness of, of sorts like to, to use what what David Attenborough his his term for for this idea um is it is it not still a form of exploitation to build a house that simply frames that landscape that has a window that looks out over that because all of a sudden that is the resource that that view that is the thing that is now being exploited because it has been commodified because you built a house which ultimately is going to be sold like that is what is creating value yeah. you don't want what you don't want in that situation if you're the designer or the, or the client is to look upon a productive landscape where you can see you know chicken farms or you know evidence of large-scale industry or, or sorry agricultural industrial agriculture you might like to see i think he describes that very nicely about people traveling to places and you know I love going there because people survive on selling handicraft. And I'm the only person who, go, who visits. Um, and we all know this because that's, we all, that is for us all the idea of nature. It is the other. It is the thing that hasn't been subject to our own scheme of production insofar as we are all, we are all part of it, the scheme of production. I actually really liked that example that he gave at the start. Like, I think there's a lot of, a lot of depth to it, like you were saying, and I think, um, you know, I found, I found myself thinking about it, wondering um, perhaps if it represents something more than just like how we see nature, maybe it's, it's also how we see culture as well, because it's not just got to do with like, like mm, he, he was framing it as, as more an ex example as though like this thing that people do is how we see nature. But like, I think that's overlooking the fact that that thing that people do, like this idea of simply visiting a place and saying, oh, this is an unspoiled place or a place of um, whatever, natural um, or, or what's, how am I, the, it, it, like unspoiled culture, um, you know, like pure culture, it, it, a, like a local culture in its purest form. Um, like, yeah, I suppose like that's exactly what we do with nature. And I, I think it comes back as well to what he was saying with this idea of seeing versus perception or, or you know, like looking at something as, a, as an aesthetic object versus actually understanding what's going there. Like simply visiting a place as a tourist is not, is not equivalent to assimilating into a culture to get, to get a deep sort of subliminal understanding of how that actually functions. I, I was very interested in uh, Burkhardt's other comment which I didn't actually realize was something that was associated with his 
way of thinking, which is, uh, you know, the invisible, the invisibility of design. And I, it's something that I've been thinking a bit about a lot, you know, that we get down to this thing about like, you know, what's the architect's role, and especially when it comes to something about, you know, development plans and urban planning and so on. And it, it strikes me that I do understand what he's saying on the one hand, when we're talking about the generality of things, maybe you know, in the general sense of the messy, of the accommodation, of the messiness of life, you know, that there's a sort of a negotiation, interdisciplinary negotiation that's going to go on to make sure that things are accommodated. But I, I'm becoming, I, I'm thinking an awful lot more these days about like the role of the architect in, you know, maybe doing that unpopular thing these days of, of doing that one little act of brilliance in a spot uh, that people can respond to, that one thing, you know, the thing, you know, the, the Campidoglio or something, you know. And I wonder if perhaps maybe as architects, you know, maybe we should just be one of the gang when it comes to discussing the generality of things, the poor heartiness of things, but that maybe we're forgetting that we have to do the Campidolios. Why do we have to do the Campidolios? Because they're the sensational things. They're the things that make life worth living. I don't know, Never, I never get those kind of conditions, so I, I can't really contribute to, uh, to, to the <laughs> question. Sorry, Mark, what did you say you never get? I never get those commissions. I was doing a kind of a Woody Allen. Oh. <laughs> um, they call an academic question for me. I, I think I, I think that maybe, you know, certainly an awful lot of the discussion in, let's say, in WIT over the past maybe 10 years would, uh, you know, when we'd be, you know, we'd be third or fourth year crits and there'd be an urban project and there'd be apartments and so on, and that kind of thing, mixed use. You know that there'd be a lot. There'd be discussion about um, the role of the art. You know, the role of essentially. You know, we get down to discussing our intervention. As we, you know, we're sort of required. You know, we're, we're sort of sociologists with AutoCAD skills, mm. and I sort of feel like, you know, well, maybe maybe that element of it. Maybe the whole sort of you know coming together of like you know the social mix and the mess and all of that stuff. Maybe that's something that we do collaboratively. Maybe that's not something that we're drawn on for. You know, maybe what we're drawn on for is something that we should get back to focusing on, which is um, making those little spaces, those sort of fantastic things that just make the life worth the living, you know, because that's yeah. what we're good at. You made that point before. It's a, it's a good point. So, and I, I suppose, Mark, or and Steph, it was something that you mentioned, or Mark maybe as well, had mentioned before about like when it comes to, you know, when we're, when we're discussing sort of this, when we're talking about like, um, what happens in the office and uh, the you know, sort of you know, the power structures in the office and where where power lies in the office. Um, it strikes me somehow that it's 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 always kind of difficult to really you know take, pull that apart because there is a step has said a few times before like what is it exactly we're doing in the office? So that I think that if we're if what we're doing in the office has a clear purpose, like we're going to make that cool, we're going to make that wonderful thing that you turn the corner and there it is, it's just fantastic. If we know that that's what we're at, then somehow our way of dealing with one another, our structure within the office, the how we do, how the, the part, how we develop our, our working relations become easier to address because we have a clearer purpose. I, I just sort of think about, I, I've been thinking about it a bit, I suppose. I, I agree very much. I think if we, if we try and clarify our motives in everything, yeah. in everything, then we, our actions become more, first of all, tentative, but then after a while, I think more confident because you're, you're trying to clarify to understand what is the ground from which you're working. Even if at first it might make you think, oh, it's kind of taking the fun out of it, wrecking the buzz. Wrecking the buzz is a kind of a good practice mm. that you need to shine a harsh light on your class origin, for example, your, your real, your darkest motives. It's a great quote from Kant about this. Um, formerly, I saw the world from my own point of view, um, but then I began to understand my darkest motives. And, and now I see it from somewhere between my point of view and the others. He wasn't insisting on some kind of false objectivity rather, but somehow or other, 
holding on to the subjective, but moving always to some, something outside of it. And so he introduced the notion of parallax for this, that you could only understand it as we move from the subjective to the objective. I'm sorry, I hope that's relevant to what you were saying, Gary. It's something to do with being clear about what we're doing objectively um, as, an, as to inform our subjective. No, I think it's very relevant. Uh, I think it's very relevant. I like Kant. Um, I, I, yeah, you see, I think, um, you know, this, this, if there is this clarity, this sense of purpose, you know, when you come together, if you're working with I, my own experience, I'm sure it's the same for everybody else, is when you're working with a sense of purpose and you're trying to do something maybe together, I make some films, we work with, I work with people, you know, it's the person who's interested in the sound, really wants to make a wonderful sound, the person who's acting wants to, wants to act so wonderful, you know, to do, and, and in those environments when we're working together, it just seems to flow because everybody knows what they're there for. Um, we're all trying to do something together. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll make a few, but maybe we won't, who knows? Nobody cares. The confusion that strikes me always comes in when, you know, when you're in the office and you're doing the housing scheme or the whatever, you know, for the, I know I'm always complaining about the developer. <laughs> uh, but when it becomes less clear why we're here, that's where the politics emerge. That's where the uncertainty arrives. That's where when the person isn't quite sure about what my contribution is, they start to use, you know, um, the, the critique of each other's involvement is always something to do with what it is always some, it's, it's never really to do with what it is that they want to do, but always something to do with, they're not putting enough time, they're not putting their weight, they're not doing this or they're not doing that. And we, I think that's, that's where we get into trouble, strikes me. Mm. And certainly, you know, when I work on, with students, um, our students anyway, is that, you know, one thing I'm always trying to do with them as we're going through, you know, as we're studying or doing, or, you know, sort of approaching our design projects is to try and get them to be clear about what it is you're doing here. Be clear about yourself, um, you know, because it's, at the end of the day, it's it's the it's the fastest you know it's the easiest way to get through the easiest way to get through life I think you know. I, I kind of, I'd like to come back to to the thing that you were saying about the Campidoglio as well because I'm really fixated fixated on it now, I, especially that that was in response to the thing that Burkhart was saying about good design should be invisible, and I think. I, I like I kind of want to push back about what you were saying, push back against like what you were saying about the Campidoglio, because I think historically those sorts of constructions were the domain of the rich. They weren't just available to everybody. Like they don't necessarily improve civic life indiscriminately. It's it was divided along wealth lines, and to a certain extent, that still sort of exists today. Like the fact that like not every piece of architecture that everybody experiences is designed by an architect, um, and and I just think like I, I I find myself agreeing more with Burkhart in this idea that that good design should be invisible simply because it should be something that we don't have to think about. It should be something that, that is available to everybody in, in, in an equitable or an equitable society. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that, because, because the reason why I, I like, I like you said that the Campidolio is something, it's something magnificent. It's something that like relative to the rest of perhaps the urban landscape, it is exceptional. What if, like, like if, if, we as architects sort of endeavor to make design if something that we actually want is to have design be available to everybody if, if like this thing that we're talking about um the the, the civic or what was the thing that the grafton architects did in 2018 for the for the for the biennale where they were talking about they wrote a piece i can't remember what it was free, but space. It had to, mm. free space yeah so if if that's something that we actually actually believe in then we shouldn't be endeavoring to make things that are exceptional we should be endeavoring to make things that are completely benign because they're so freely available oh yeah completely ideological um document the free space manifesto and 
it was, by, by which I mean, I, I say this in Venice to Shelley when she came to visit us, we were there with students, and she got really thick with me, because what I said to her was quite simply, at the moment when the one, if not the major issue on people's minds about architecture in the world and housing, is housing affordability, and you announced that the uh, Biennale is called Free Space, and she said, it's nothing to do with money. And I'm going, but you say it in the manifesto, even in the most commercially da 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 architecture offers gifts. This is all the language of what we normally mean by free, something that doesn't cost money. She got up and left. She got really pissed off, which means yeah. I hit a button because once again, the architect, as well as designing buildings, has been called upon to make statements which seek to resolve things using a certain fuzziness, a certain, you know, easy, easiness with language where, well, we don't really mean free, of course. We, we mean some, you know, uh, and I don't blame her because that's what she's been asked to do. Um, but it's ideological. It's the same thing as using nature. I went up, I thought I'd said to her, no, but I only said to you, Steph, but I went up to get a book because it's a guy called Jan Starobinsky. Does anyone know a friend? The book is from the 60s. And I just, wish I had all these books, Mark. That you, you just whet my appetite for reading so much. It's incredible. So this is, well, this is this I remember because it's the first page of this book. Oh no, I have that book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The first page of it, chapter one. It's just can I read this quote from this guy Starobinsky? Is that okay if I read it? It's a short, short. Sure, of course, of course. He says the Baroque system had operated as a kind of double intersection. It had often contrasted with rationalized gardens, building facades decorated with plant motifs. The reign of man and the reign of nature had certainly remained distinct, but they had exchanged their characteristics, merging into each other for the sake of ornamentation and prestige. On the other hand, the English style park in which man's intervention was supposed to remain invisible was intended to offer the purposefulness of nature. While within, but separate from the actual park, the houses constructed by Morris and Adam manifested the will of man, isolating clearly the presence of human reason in the midst of the irrational domains of freely growing vegetation. The Baroque interpenetration of man and nature was now replaced by a separation, thus establishing the distance between man and nature, which was prerequisite for nostalgic contemplation. Now the contemplative separation arose as a compensatory or expiatory reaction against the growing attitude of practical men towards nature. While technical exploitation tended to wage war on nature, houses and parks attempted a reconciliation, a local armistice, introducing the dream of an impossible peace. And to this end, man had continued to retain the image of untouched natural surroundings. It's very much like what we've just been reading in, in the text that you sent us, but just, I think, a very eloquent uh, development of it, going back to the Baroque. I think that's, I think that's interesting, Mark. Actually, uh, I'm, I'll... There's a couple of things in my mind. Uh, Steph, yeah, when, when we were talking, I, you're absolutely right. Like, you know, these uh, papal set pieces and so on. I mean, they're sort of, uh, I, well, actually, I don't know, you know, three or 400 years ago, who knows what the, I don't know what the feeling of the buzz on the street was. They hadn't read their marks yet. You know, they, they, didn't, they hadn't really examined those kinds of things. But I guess when I was talking about the Campidoglio, <clears throat> I didn't mean like things like the Campidoglio. I mean, the Campidoglio, the Laurentian Library, uh, the Institut de Mont um, the Teatro Olimpico, uh, maybe, I don't know, a half dozen other things where it's, you, it really, regardless of whatever the circumstances were, the architects involved uh, examined and analyzed uh, and pulled something together so that when you walk around the corner and you, and you like when you go into the Teatro Olimpico for the very first time, you you know you just go, holy shit, and all the politics just goes out the window. You just you think like this guy knows something about the things that make space, that you know the the way form and light and material and so on can come together, that you step into something and you just go, this is just absolutely wonderful this is one of the great moments of my life so it's it's that sort of it's that thing it's you know that bit of it that uh, and that can be i mean that can happen with or without you know that can happen with or without money or you know some of the most extraordinary ex architectural experiences i've had you know been sort of nothing to do you know with whether they had money to begin with or who had the power but i uh, but that sorry it, but actually mark yeah the baroque i'm uh i look the baroque i'm um, 
you know, there, I, I definitely think this, there, are two, there are two definitions of the Baroque. There's the Northern European version, which is, you know, the Louis XIV thing. And then there, which, I, which is popularly referred to as the Baroque. And then there's the real Baroque, which is Borromini and the Sicilians, which is to do with a, an incredible understanding of form. And I don't think they're related. Okay. Um, Tom, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, Tom. Yeah. That's an interesting point. I was going to just leap to the defense of the Campidoglio for a second. Go uh, for it. <laughs> well, I, I, the Campidoglio is, uh, I agree with you, Steph, completely, but um, just it helps that the Campidoglio is a civic structure, it, it's the kind of town hall. Um, so it's, I guess, if you wanted to um, maybe explain how, you know, how, how it is, as it is, you know, what it is, um, it's a sort of an appropriate setting for, for civic interaction, you know, and that the role of the architecture there is just, is to structure that kind of, um, um, but, you know, as against that, I completely agree that, uh, you know, um, architecture then becomes uh, just uh, a way of, um, uh, expressing or manifesting power, power structures in, in the city or whatever. So, um, so it's kind of it's kind of good to to, to uh, try and find another way of think, thinking about architecture. And uh, just uh, Gary, uh, I think there's a sort of a, a role of architecture, a kind of transformative role maybe. Um, and I just think of people like Lacton but Lasalle and the way that they kind of approach problems um, in, in a really interesting way and manage to, like with just very simple means, manage to kind of transform situations in, in, in a way that you, you, know, you, you couldn't have imagined, um, trans, transform people, people's lives uh, with, with it. You know? So I'm just thinking like how, how they've redone the, those apartment buildings in Bordeaux and Paris. You probably all know those projects now. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. I think they just won a big award for those for a big big architecture. Yeah, but I mean it's just such a simple, you know, not to demolish those blocks and, um, but to 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 just completely transform people's lives by giving them this the most amazing uh, extra space, you know, extra living area. Um, I just think it's just really uh, incredible. So yeah. I, I suppose there's like. Um, you know the role of the architect in in that scenario is, is kind of transformational one. Or, you know, it's got a on, you know on behalf of, of people who who don't have much power. You know, who, who are social tenants. Um, Do you know? I would beg to differ about uh, Lacatan and Basal. I mean, not sorry, Gary. I cut across you. Do you want to, do you want to go first? No, not at all. I was no. I, I'm done. Um, Lacatan are clearly interesting. That what you describe as social work. But I've seen some horrendous projects. They did a scheme for the glass bottle site in the first competition for it. And uh, it was breathtakingly, gargantuanly uh, hideous. No, hideous, I don't mean not beautiful and so on, but it was certainly didn't have any of these things which go with the claims for them now, which is that they don't expend energy. They don't waste material because they reuse buildings. Hmm. And I actually prefer to see them differently. I think they're in tradition of um, production aesthetic like machine aesthetic, production aesthetic. Mm. Yeah, I get you, I get you, yeah. The best way of comparing their work is, I mean, something like the Eames House, where, you know, which we make a house looking like a factory in that way. Um, and that has always been, that could be brought back to our text because our text is, I believe, the great subject, which is just for want of a better word, nature. Uh, when you add to the concept of nature, the Marxist, for instance, idea of technology reveals that man's dealings with nature, then we can see almost all of architecture since the Enlightenment has been a, a dialectic between, maybe since the Renaissance, which is Tafari's idea, between different notions of control of nature, domination of nature, as expressed. And Lacatan seemed to me to be in a tradition, a modernist tradition of technical domination of nature. And um, now, notwithstanding their actual production of spaces and cost cutting techniques and so on. Mm. I, I don't know enough about those. Mm. The alternative, the opposite end of it has been maybe the current, the ecological, maybe, maybe this is a tradition from the Baroque to the English gardens, to the arts and crafts, to Art Nouveau, 
And maybe uh, the ecological um, concerns, green design perhaps are part of that tradition. And if, if they are, that's a big challenge to uh, claims by ecological designers to be saving the world or to be certainly at least reducing carbon emissions at a significant level, um, which, you know, no doubt they can do. But to what extent is green design part of that tradition of uh, a reaction through design to the domination of nature? Because that's been going back for a long time. And the Baroque certainly contained that. Mm. It contained that, that reaction to I mean, remember the Baroque, the Roman Baroque emerged, whatever, uh, interesting what you're saying, Gary, but the Roman Baroque certainly emerged uh, after the, during the Thirty Years' War, which was, uh, a, you, did you say, Tom, half of the German population was, somebody tell us that. A, qu a quarter of the German population died, yeah. And it was, uh, like all of these wars, it was a, a war over new emerging classes, new emerging productive classes, you know, new mm. forms of, uh, breaking through some kind of settled order and producing this like seismic plate tectonic shift and um, the emergence of merchant capital. I don't know what were the causes of the 30 years war. I'm assuming it wasn't just a squabble over some, something minor. It was a squabble over um, the, the big ends versus the little ends, wasn't it? The big part of, say that, say more. Uh, so if you open your egg at the big end, Okay. Or if you open your egg at the little end. Okay. Where was it was uh, well, it was it was it was at least three wars, and uh, it wasn't just Germany. I mean, the Swedes were involved, and I, I mean, it was a war. There were there were at least, there were, you know you had uh, Lutherans versus Calvinists, Lutherans versus Catholics, Catholics versus Catholics, and Lutherans versus Cal I can't remember now how many, but I mean there were at least three distinct wars and maybe four or five others. And it does strike me, you know, looking back at it, that I, I find it very, very difficult to believe that all these people were motivated just because some silly monk came out and said whatever it is that he said that I can't even remember, you know. I, and even when I think about it, like uh, Sole Fide, I have to get my head around it. I just can't imagine 20 million people going to war because some monk said Sole Fide. They went to war because this is the beginnings, you know, the beginnings. I mean, it was northern, northern German command of the landscape and um, their understanding of, uh, and, the, and the notion of having to, you know, essentially sort of control the, control the production. I mean, that's, I, I really do think that's what the Thirty Years' War so was about. 